What's going on, everybody? Welcome into a special edition here of the Energy Newsbeat Daily Stand Up here on June 15th, 2024. A gorgeous Saturday. We appreciate you guys taking some time out on your Saturday, whether you're mowing the lawn, whether you're going for a little drive, whether you're like Stu and you're climbing underneath your house to fix some plumbing. We appreciate you, <laughs> we appreciate you guys tuning in. We got a, I mean, great week, Stu. Lots of great articles we oh. ran this week. We saw a few deals that happened. So, you know, it was a packed week. Uh, unbelievable. And the, the energy news is just going nuts around the world. Unbelievable. I've never seen this much news. No, it's it's absolutely, guys. Well, we we appreciate it. You know, as always, the news and analysis you're about to hear brought to you by that world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. Hit the description below. Go ahead and check out links to all of the articles that we're about to run. Uh, check out our new trading desk, which is where if you're if you're looking to buy, sell, or broker crude oil, LNG. And, you know, any refined product, go ahead and hit our trading desk, fill out the form, and we will get in contact with you and, and route you to the right direction, whether you're U.S., international, whether it's Stu trying to put you know an extra 5,000 barrels in his backyard for safe keepings because now Russia is doing nuclear testing in the Caribbean. <laughs> you know, you never know what you might need. But, you know, or if you're an oil tanker and you need some oil, check us out, guys. Trading desk, you can hit the link in the description below. I don't really got anything else, Sue. I'm just going to leave it up to them, you and the kids, and figure out what stories to run until nice. Monday. Hey, let's start with our buddies out there in New Zealand. But this has got one. This came out of the Telegraph, Michael. New Zealand to uh, lift oil ban amid blackout fears. And it's a blow to Starmer up in England. Policy reversal is a blow to Labor's plan for similar crackdown in the North Sea. The North Sea uh, just had, and Norway had a major natural gas shutdown, and it spiked electricity prices for the EU, I mean, for the UK. So, New Zealand, out of this story, New Zealand was on Saturday night expected to revoke a ban for drilling and oil and gas amid fears of blackouts um, as the labor plans in the UK are a similar crackdown in the North Sea. The North Sea is, is really got some history on that. Uh, New Zealand faces an energy shortage which threatens our electrical system and the competitiveness of our energy exporters we now urgently need to attract further investment and in exploration and production to keep the lights on our houses warm and businesses <laughs> it's amazing what happens that chart in their north sea decline when you compare look at this uh miss producer if you could bring that up that chart 20 to 21 um 20 to 23 and then you take a look at the forecast, it is declining. What I see is also a loss of tax revenue that these chowderheads are not figuring out. Oh, wait a minute. Loss of, of low-cost energy, loss of tax revenue equals skyrocketing energy prices. Yeah, I mean, in, in to focus specifically on what's going on in, in New Zealand, this is a country that as of 2018 only imported about 17 or only produced about 17 percent of its overall oil and gas needs. So they critically need access, one, to local domestic drilling, which they banned right. it in, um, was it 2021? Is that yeah. the year that they banned it? No, 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 yes. no. 2018, no, no. they banned it. Um, and that was under a previous uh, regime um, mm -hmm. that, that 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 prime minister was voted out, actually, in early 2023. A new right-wing coalition came in. So that's one of the reasons the wheels are turning to change it. But, I mean, you have to – and it's not even about oil. It's about yeah. natural gas it, you know, at, at some point, it doesn't matter how two, natural gas prices are because you've got to go out and get energy to be able to supply your grid. You either get it from elsewhere, which can be extremely expensive, and that premium relative to where you're going to purchase it on top of the cost it would, uh, it you know, the producer's going to need in order to just at least get their money back, maybe less than the fact that even though you might make, you might not make that much money on it, you're going to make more profit margin relative to producing yourself relative to importing it. So I think it's a really interesting shell game you have going on here. Um, 
specifically in New Zealand. I mean, they have a lot of gas there. It's they have a decent amount of gas there. They got about 2.2 uh, or 2.1, um, you know, gosh, I don't even know. PJ, I think is what pentajoules. I don't even know what that terminology is. I'm just reading off Wikipedia here. They got a lot of they got a lot of remaining gas they could go get out there. So good for New Zealand to dive back in. It just goes to show you that um, a lot of these. <laughs> A lot of these decisions that are being made are getting reversed quickly as people starting actually read the data. I mean, we all like to joke that everybody's stupid. Everybody is not stupid when there's a gun to their head. And I'm not. And, and the proverbial <laughs> gun to your head is lights are going to be turned off. You're going to have no power. That is the proverbial gun to your the, head. The, what if- the people are waking up, Michael, to the deindustrialization of the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal equals deindustrialization. Yeah, the Green New Deal did not happen in New Zealand, but there, the, well, yeah, what people yes, are realizing Michael, is that- Michael, yes, it did. If you take a look at another article that was posted out on this, the the uh, other article was New Zealand's party, uh, the government the, said uh, they stopped it in, in 2018 under then leader Joaquin Ardern, but continued to allow other ones so they could bolster their renewable uh, energy. So yeah, absolutely. yes, the, the Green New Deal, though, specifically relates to what's what happened in the United States. It's happening all around the world. Just depending it's on what a generic you term it. now. The Green New Deal, the Greens and the Greens in the party. I was referring to a green. People are referring to it, the Green New Deal around the world, Michael. I'm not sure why. Um, the price of green is going high. There are five key bullet points to this one. And when you sit back and take a look at the article, uh, Michael, first one, people around the world are beginning to uh, object to the increasingly expensive cost of the energy transition being forced on them by their government <laughs> and businesses. Number two, a paper by the Climate Policy in, uh, Initiative, the CPI, advocates for much heftier expenses for consumers by recommending a seven-fold increase in money spent on programs to achieve UN goals reaching $9 trillion annually by 2030. Annually, we can't, the world can't afford that and increasing after that. CPI is an international group with an initial funding from George Soros that advocates for aggressive climate actions. Number four, Europe has already begun to deindustrialize and with Germany leading the way as they want to retreat from some of their costliest plans under public pressure. Number five, States in the United States, such as California, have led the green initiatives are also beginning to push back on some green policies. We're seeing that in the next article, in with the, our last article from Virginia. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, clearly, I mean, again, let's go back to this, the climate policy initiative. They think that we need to go from one point three trillion of funding to nine trillion. I mean, that's just a redistribution. That's just a redistribution of wealth. And whether or not that number is true or not, the question is, can we actually do that? And if we spent nine trillion dollars, would we be what better it, off you? than we are now? See, that's right. Thing. I, I think what people you don't understand is there's always a there's always an opportunity cost we, you know i'm an economist right. so i think of i think of these things all the time if i'm going to do x what's the opportunity cost of not doing y and if the opportunity cost is less we'll go do x in this case if the opportunity cost of not moving to renewables is less than the opportunity cost of moving to right. renewables you 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 might as well do it the problem is they look at a small sliver and they're using this word, and I'm using quotes for our podcast listeners, climate science to make this argument that the opportunity cost is way more than it is way more. When if you actually look at, if you take into account other things like the economy, people's well-being, all this other stuff, and you group it all into more of a meta-analysis, I mean, the answer becomes a lot more muddied than just, oh, we're going to save the exactly. world from, from two degrees. Yeah. So it's it's the second, third, 
fourth order effects. I mean, when they throw these big nine trillion, ten trillion numbers, right. out, the first thing I think of, well, they're they're just trying to redistribute the wealth from one group of. I mean, at the end of the day, it's redistributing wealth from one group of rich people to another group of rich people. So I'm not concerned for either one of them per se, but it is interesting how I, right. at the core of what they're mm -hmm. trying to do, it's trying to get the people they like the money and not the people they don't like. Exactly. Here's here's a paragraph in here that is right above the conclusion, Michael. Illinois, which is requiring 50% of its re electricity be renewable by 2030, had its power regulator reject grid improvement plans from two utilities stating the state's household should not be unfairly asked to shoulder undue costs uh, tied to the state's energy transition. The CEO of one of those Illinois uh, utilities, Exelon, protested because the requirements is going to cost money. The question is, who's going to pay? If the state does not, utilities could go out of business, thereby transmitting no power to residents who expect lights on 24 by 7. It's a complicated problem. It's extremely complicated. Let's go to California. California's impossible war on oil and gas. They cannot get enough brutalizing what's keeping their lights on. The assault on oil and gas has been relent relentless. In September of 2023, California Attorney General Rob Bona sued ExxonMobil, Shell, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and BP for causing climate change. Well, has anybody bothered to tell California that the only reason that they reduced any chance of their CO2 output was because of their natural gas generation? They are, they've got about 42% of their power is between nuclear and natural gas, but yet they're trying to shut down all of their natural gas that they possibly can and import more oil from Iran, China, and Russia. And it is just despicable. And they're doing more harm to the environment and to the uh, in, than they possibly can. So when you take a look at energy trends based on the Statistical Review of World Energy published annually in the 2023 edition, current data equates to 288 gigajoules per capita in the United States and a mere 67 gigajoules per capita in the rest of the world by 2050. That's even got number is going to be off a ton when you consider AI and data centers. So California's climate war warriors may succeed in a quest to eliminate fossil fuels in their state, but it will become a grievous uh, cost to their fellow residents as an example for the rest of the world it cannot possibly emulate. So, you know what, California, I feel sorry for anyone. I love California. I love the times that I visit there, will not live there, but I'll tell you what, I just feel sorry for the folks that are stranded and can't get out of that state. And when you take a look, the other article on here, California to set uh, set to crank gas power and emissions to keep cool. So they have got some serious um, power problems. Listen to this. Between 2021 and 2023, Casio operators boosted gas fired gas uh, powered uh, plants by an average of 72 percent during the june to august window from the average levels of the previous three months they have got to have the natural gas to keep the load balanced there you can have an oversupply of solar but at the transition time between solar and night you've got to have the emergency or the stable grid stabilization of natural gas plants the steep climb in solar has just really caused a problem with the balancing authorities and the keeping it up so an excellent article and this is from reuters the myth of the inevitable rise of the petro one i'll tell you michael i've been you know with bricks and the advent of our stupidity in our management of our country I've been saying it's been coming, and this article is quite the opposite. Let me give you a couple of highlights here. Astonishing as it is, quote, the narrative is an illusion. 
First, if you believe in conspiracy theories, the introduction of the Petro One and the ensuing collapse of the petrodollar would be the first domino potentially weakening the entire whole U.S. financial system. Very serious. A redrawing of the global economic map, the backdrop to global wars and crises. Now, the author of this article goes on to say that it's not going to happen and that the petrodollar is going to hang on and that the petro yuan is not going to because the agreement with Riyadh and China mentioned nothing in there about the petro yuan. I missed that totally. MDS did not want the petro yuan. So I'm I've got a the last line in this article ironically the only new petro currency to emerge of late has been the dirham of the United Arab Emirates India using it to settle some oil transactions with Russia bypassing use of sanctions also the ruble which is not mentioned in this article as well as some others but this guy is saying that the petro dollar is here for a while what do you think? Well, it's it's I think it's it's going to be a lot harder than we think to migrate off the 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 petrodollar from a standpoint of there's a lot of business already wrapped up in that. I do think the petro yuan is coming slowly. It's all about the supply chains and how you know we've talked at nauseum about how the supply chains right. are shifting to exclude the United States. When that happens, there's no need for the dollar if you're never going to exactly. eventually go back to the United States and as more isolated nations get as russia russia has shown you can do it you can have a stable economy and not have access to any of the western right. banks and all that jazz so yeah, the swift russia, system yes exactly. they've got it's not needed anymore so no. I, I i'm a firm believer that yes the petro yuan is coming but it may not even be the petro one it's just going to be the petro not dollar Petro not dollar. How cool is that, Michael? I, I like the way you phrase that. The Petro not dollar. Houston Energy Company to build the largest refinery in half a century. Listen to this. It will process more than 160,000 barrels of gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel from shale oil production. It's pretty interesting. Element Fuel Holdings is spending between three and four billion on the project, which will produce more than 160,000 barrels per day of diesel uh, jet fuel. And uh, it's pretty cool. I know. What's also crazy is that Element Fuel Holdings is a relatively new company. They also say they intend to produce enough hydrogen, supply all of the refinery's power needs, which is going to apparently, according to them, significantly reduce their emissions compared to the older refineries. Again, this is a Houston-based firm. You know, I would have expected a bigger boy to get one of these. You know, this isn't a Shell. This isn't an Exxon. No. This isn't a Chevron. I mean, this is a, a smaller company. It's good to see. I'm glad they went ahead and got this approved down there in Brownsville. But I, it goes to show you how necessary new refineries are and how new you can make them, especially if you can produce enough hydrogen where you don't have to – you can run itself. It's a oh. self-perpetuating refinery. And and uh, the fact that we got a new one since fifty years, that to me is out of the park huge. It's it's pretty and it's good. It's gonna provide a